the goal is to get in old. Amen? Because the alternative, Terry, is dead. So it's okay to get old. Amen? I was thinking this morning, I wish I'd had a pedicure. Amen? I'm going to tell you a quick story before I preach. When I was in seminary, I was doing some financial consulting. <laughs> and I was leaving to fly to Oklahoma for a week for a job. And I was sitting on my bed reading with my shoes off. And my wife was painting her fingernails and toenails pink. And before I knew it, I had several of my toes painted pink. And so I said something to her, and the first thing she says, well, if the plane goes down, we can recognize the body by the toes. Amen? But that's not the worst part. I didn't do anything about it. I left it, didn't think anything about it. No big deal. I went on about my business. Don't really look at your feet that often. But about halfway through the week, I was at this job in Oklahoma, Tulsa, and the owner or the general manager came to me and said, hey, um, can I take you to, to out to eat tonight and, and I want to show you some of the town or whatever. And I said, sure, that'd be great. So he took me out and took me out to eat. And while I was with him, I found out he was struggling with some marital problems. And so he began to share his heart with me. And while he's sharing his heart with me, he just began to cry and weep. And I mean, I was praying with him. I counseled with him. I, I did everything I could to encourage him in his marriage. Well, I, I left, he dropped me off, got my car, went back to the hotel where I was staying, and a couple hours later, my door, the knock on the door, and I looked through the door, and it was him. And he said, would you mind if I came, I had a little suite, they had rented me this little suite, so it had an extra bed with a couch and stuff pulled out. And he said, would you mind if I stay here tonight, my wife and I are having problems, and I need a place to stay. I said, no, go ahead, come on in. And so I went to sit up, and I'm talking to him, and I had my feet kind of propped up on the coffee table, and I wasn't paying attention, but I kept seeing his eyes. And his eyes kept looking at my feet. And when I finally noticed my feet, I realized I was in a strange position. Amen? He called me every day after that. I, no, I'm just kidding. Amen? But God puts us in strange positions, right? I want to try my best to continue to tell you about value and really... My concern today is growing up in our value, growing up. I, I don't know why I don't like the word mature because I remember this guy said mature. The definition of mature is right before rot. And I always thought, man, I don't like that term. But the truth is we need to mature, amen? We need to grow up. We need to get ready for the things of God. And I believe God wants us all to grow up. And the more that we grow, and the more that we grow up, spiritually speaking, the more concerning our values, we get them in line, get them in order, get them straight. And so there's four things that I'm going to hit on highlight real quickly is a few values on some uh, our possessions, our positions, our pleasures, and things like that. And so I want to read this to you, then we're going to, I'm going to pray, then we're going to read this, and then we're going to go from there. Amen? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We thank you for the word. God, I thank you for the hearts of your people. God, I thank you so much for my wife. And God, I thank you so much for this worship team. I got, God, I thank you for what you're doing in their lives. And God, this is the greatest church in the world. And what a privilege to pastor it. Got some of the greatest people in the world here. And so God, bless us to be upon them. God, use this time to open our ears and hearts. God, those who have came to hear the word of God, God, I pray that you begin to turn their lives around. God, I don't want to leave here the same. I always want to be on the increase with you. So God, let this day be that day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before I read, I, I want to brag on our worship team. I don't know if anybody noticed or not on our worship team, and I don't follow this a lot. He showed me this last night. But they sing a song, I think Shout Loud. They sing a song, and uh, recently, uh, apparently the, the, the church and the, the guy who wrote that song posted it on their website, us singing their song. And they posted it on their website. I guess they, they put a little video of us singing. We had it online, and they took it, and they put it on their website. So isn't that cool? Amen? Give our worship a hand. Amen? It's pretty good when somebody puts the song they wrote on their website that somebody else is singing. 
We read here in Ephesians 4, it's talking about the five-fold ministry here. And really, I titled this thing, Growing Up in Godly Value. But I, I really maybe want to kind of revamp that, that term. But just talking about maybe a better understanding of what we value. Amen? And the more that we value, like I said earlier, I believe with all my heart, God wants us to always be on the increase with Him. Amen? I believe if we stand still or we're going back, we're backsliding. I think we need to always be on the increase with God. Because, see, the enemy has a way of knowing exactly where you're at. And if he knows exactly where you're at and you ain't going any further, then he'll catch you where you're at. He'll trap you. See, he comes like a roaring lion. And I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, talk about how we need to take that roaring lion and we need to put him on a leash. Amen? And we need to control the leash. Instead of him pulling us or controlling us, we need to control him. So let's read here in Ephesians 4. It says, And he gave, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. They refer to this as a fivefold ministry. Why did he do this? He says, For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. In other words, as a pastor, as an evangelist, as a position in the fivefold ministry, our job is to equip the body of Christ to fulfill the work of the ministry. A long time ago, God showed me that the body was going to feed the body. Amen? Now, I know that we only have a couple small groups, and I really believe in all my heart as we grow, I want to have a, a bunch of small groups. I think it's important that we have a bunch of small groups because it's important that we fellowship one with another. It's important that we begin to grow one with another. And the truth is, we help each other grow. Because, see, there are people in your life that you can tell things to. You can help them in situations that nobody else can help them in. You can tell them about something God done for you in your situation that they're going to grow in because of something you went through. Amen? Let's keep going here. For the equipment of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now we do this, he says, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. A great way of describing unity, a friend of mine said a long time ago, unity is when you and I tie. Amen? When we come in agreement together. He goes on to say, he says... Uh, to the knowledge, to the faith, and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measures of the statues of the fullness of Christ. God wants us to be full, not half empty. Right? We need to go to the fullness of God. We need to know that God has a whole lot more for us. I don't think we ever totally fill up. I want to believe with all my heart that God has more for me today than he had yesterday. Do you? Amen? Don't we all need to grow in the things of God? He wants us to go to the fullness of God. And then he says this. He says he wants us to do these things. He wants us to have these teachings, these, you know, learnings, whatever, however you want to say it. He wants to do all these things because, he says, that we shall no longer be children. Now, I don't know about you, but there was a time in my life where, you know, I enjoyed my kids, you know, being my kids. But now, you know what? I want them to grow up. I don't want to put a bottle in their mouth. When you've got to part a mustache and put a bottle in the mouth, that's not a pretty sight. Amen? He says, no longer be children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine. There are some crazy things out there. Do you agree with me? There's some stuff out there that we need to know the truth about. And if we don't know the truth about, we get kind of carried away with it, and we'll follow it, and all of a sudden it'll take us away to places we shouldn't go and destroy our life. By the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of the deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up, may grow up, may grow up. We need to grow up. Amen? Amen? may grow up in all things into him who is the head, into Christ. We need to grow up into Christ, knowing who Christ really is. From whom the whole body, that's us, you and I, joined and knitted together by every joint supplies according to effective work by which every part does its share. Every one of us that has a part. I, I teach that. I believe that. I, I, I want to emphasize that. I never wanted you to believe that, you know what, if you depend on me for everything, you're going to have a hard time. You need to be, believe with all your heart that you need to grow up and you supply. You have just as much importance in this kingdom as I do. We all have to supply and do our part. I thought about how <clears throat> myself, I am somewhat competitive. I, I, I'm, I'm a competitive guy. I like to be competitive. And I know when I used to play volleyball... <laughs> One of the things I, I thought when I played volleyball is I needed to be on the front row when the ball was hit to the front row. I needed to be in the back row when the ball was hit in the back row. But the truth is, if I was on the back row and I ran to the front row and the ball was hit to the back row where I should have been, the ball would get dropped. Can I get an amen? 
And see, we all have a part. Some might be on the front row, some might be on the back row. But all of us have a part in this thing we call life. He goes on to say, uh, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. We can only do what we do in love. Because God is love. If you struggle with love, I'm going to tell you real quickly, you struggle with God. Amen? Because God is love. Well, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know what they caused me. Well, you know what? There's so many people out there just like you, including myself, that's been hurt by people. But you know what? We have to learn to love as Christ loved us. And I'm going to talk about that in just a moment also. He says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer, no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. When you read this and he talks about the Gentiles, he's talking about the world. Okay? He's talking about outside. He's talking about the flesh. We shouldn't walk as the world walks. And he talks about we shouldn't waste all the time uh, of their mind. Having, he goes on to say, having their understanding darkened. In other words, they don't understand because they can't see. Many times when we think, well, I don't know why my neighbor don't understand, we ask yourself a question. Is he a believer? No. Uh, there's your answer. He has never had an enlightenment. And the truth is, until they do, you cannot really beat them over the head with something because they'll never learn. Unless they have an enlightenment for themselves, you're going to really struggle with your relationship. There are some relationships that I have that I know they don't understand, so I don't, you know, I try my best to be the example I should be, but you know what? If I try to force an understanding on them, they might nod at you and act like they understand, but the truth, they don't because they have never been enlightened. He says, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Now, there's one place that talks about if a man wants to be ignorant, just let him be ignorant. They're ignorant because of the blindness of the heart. Now, we talked about a couple weeks ago how the blind man was on the side of the road, was healed, and he cried out for sight. Now, he couldn't see Jesus come, but he heard about Jesus, and he began to shout really loud. People were trying to shut him up, but I don't know about you, but if I'm blind and I know that somebody is coming by that can heal me, I'm going to holler to the top of my lungs until I get his attention. He says, who's being past feelings, have given himself over to lowliness, in other words, to the flesh, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But he says to us, but you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him, have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. That's what the old man does, okay? And again, we have to see the fact that, you know, the old things are passed away, all things have become new. We're not the old person anymore. We're not, if you're married, don't live like a single person. If you try to live like a single person and you're married, you're going to have problems. He goes to say, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Let me go back to that again. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, let me say this, and I'm going to jump to another part here. But whenever you talk about the renewal of the mind, we have to understand, and I've said this before, and I know maybe you visited with the first time, or maybe you never heard me say this before, but I want to say it now. If you accept Christ, if you're here today, and you're lost, and you accept Christ in your heart, into your life, as Jesus is coming to my life right now, I want you to know the moment you accept Christ into your heart, you're saved. If you die right at that moment, I don't care what kind of lifestyle you live, I don't care what's at your house, I don't care what's in your car, I don't care what's out there. If you accept Christ in your life at that moment, you're saved. But here's what I'm trying to teach you this morning. Your mind is not saved. Come on. There's a renewing process. And see, the more that we study God's Word, the more that we learn what God is trying to tell us, the more that we get into the fellowship with the body of Christ, the more we see other people doing all the right things, the more we learn about the things of Christ, the more we grow in Christ. There are baby Christians today that when you pat them on the back, they burp. Come on, somebody. And here's the truth. It's okay. It's okay. My granddaughter, I, I mean, you know, we have a baby in, in the family right now, and, and, and she came to the house, and man, that little girl would let out a, a burp, rock this church. Amen? You know why? Because she's full. 
And she's letting out that burp because she's growing. Come on, somebody. And the more that we spiritually grow, the more we spiritually eat God's milk and drink God's milk and eat God's food, it's okay. But it comes a time. Come on. We have to have manners. Man, this is good preaching. We have to have manners. And so what I want to hit on for just a little while is I want to talk about a few things that we should really value because concerning us growing up in Christ, there are some things that we really have to look at. We have to learn, renew our thinking, renew our mind. And if we don't, it will cause us a trap, bait of Satan, that will cause us to fall. And the first thing is this. We need to grow up on how we value our possessions. Amen? Now here's what the Bible says. He's talking about this rich man. He's talking about this parable. He's talking about how he's a fool. But he says this in, in one place in Luke uh, 12, 15. And he said to him, take heed and beware of covetous. For one life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possess. It's not what you have that makes you. Now, I know this to be true because there was a time in my life I struggled with that. There was a time in my life that I thought what I had was my possessions is what really was somewhat of what made me. Come on. And the truth was, I was, I was saved and in church. Now, I say all the time, and I, and I say this quite often, it's okay to have things. Just don't let things have you. Now, again, when we learn these things, we must understand what the Word of God says about these things. It's not just me telling you about these things. It's talking about how we need to heed to the Word of God. This is what the Word of God says. In Timothy 6, and I'm going to jump down to the meat of these things. There's a lot there if you want to go back and read it. 1 Timothy 6, that whole chapter is fantastic. But I want to jump to verse 10. It says this. I'll tell you what, let me go to 9. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. And it's a many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction. Okay, now verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, let me read it into the, the message. It says, lust for money brings trouble. Nothing but trouble. Going down that path, some lose their footing in the faith completely and live to regret it bitterly even afterwards. Now, again, let me, let me say this so you, you, you have an understanding, all right? It's okay to have money, just don't let it have you. Now, possessions, we have to learn that they're already here today and gone tomorrow. There's even a scripture that basically says you can't take them with you. And so we have to learn to let go. What's, what's most important is what we do for the kingdom of God, okay? Because he says here in one place, he says, don't worry about what you have. Don't worry about what you put on. Don't worry about you, what you're going to eat. Don't worry about the clothes. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about these things. And then he says, here's the most important thing of all. Seek me first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And don't worry, all those things will be added to you. Everything you stand in need, I got your back. See, when we learn to let go and let God deal with it, and the more that we can let go, the more God can give. The more that we cannot let go, the more that we really shouldn't have, because the more we have, it has us, and it will destroy you. There are people today, the Bible says, that have lost their way. They have lost their footings. They have lost because, you know what, they start having so many things, and all of a sudden they find themselves in a position where they're having a hard time letting it go. We go back to the rich ruler. He says, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God, inherit life, inherit eternal life? He says, well, keep the commandments. So I've done all that. I hadn't, I hadn't killed anybody. I hadn't stolen anything. I, I honored my parents. He says, okay, well, you've done all these things. It's one thing. One thing, which I said earlier, Paul said one thing is forgetting what's behind me and reaching what's for it. He says, there was one thing. He says, sell everything you got. Distribute to the poor. Follow me. 
And then he goes on to say, listen, don't worry about all the things you just sold. There's nobody in this world that's ever got rid of all these things that I hadn't repaid a hundredfold, basically. And see, that's the part that a lot of people miss. That's a lot of people that, that lose sight of. Listen. And I'm not saying this, please don't, don't, don't shout me down. But when I walked away from a very lucrative job, I will tell you in a heartbeat, I wouldn't go back to that for nothing in the world. I did not leave anything behind. Why? Because I understood the value of the future. Amen. I understood what I was to gain. In my carnal mind, I thought I was to lose. I remember when Brother Brown and a few people from the church moved us from our house in the Garden District with an in-ground pool, with a, with, a, with a pool house. I mean, it was a gorgeous place that we had. And I remember them coming and picking up our stuff. And I, I can remember them mumbling. Martha and, and, and Miss Cassandra and I was mumbling. And finally I was like, well, what are y'all mumbling about? And they were just like, you're moving out of this? Into that trailer behind the church? And I was like, yes, ma'am. I was happy because I understood what the real value was. Come on, somebody. See, the value was not... And what I possessed. The value was in the fact I was doing exactly where God wanted me at the same time God wanted me. And for those who don't know, when I came here, the church could not even give me nothing. The only thing I was able to have was a place to stay. But I'm telling you this morning, I wouldn't trade that for nothing in the world. Why? Because I understood when I first came to this church and we had 15 people and five of those were my family. Fifteen. You know what my value was? I knew exactly where I was. I knew God called me, and I knew that God was going to do something. And all I knew was, God, I don't know how we're going to make it. But you know what? You said, seek you first. Don't worry about the rest. And I'm going to tell you, we didn't worry about the rest. There were days I found out later it was Brother Kelvin. Brother Kelvin would go on Sunday night and buy all the leftover chicken at Walmart. He would get a big discount on it at the time. And he would hang it on my door. Come on. Guess what? We ate a lot of chicken. It was fried good chicken. Amen? You can take chicken and do a lot of things with chicken. Amen? I think chickens are to be saint. Saint chicken. Amen? Somebody's like, I'm getting hungry talking about all that chicken. But you know what? I never, never worried about God taking care of us. Because every time I turn around, God was going to supply all our needs. And so learning to value possessions. Here, learning to grow up and how you value pleasure. Here's what the Bible says. 2 Timothy says this in 3, 1. It says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers in themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemous, dishon disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. It says all these other things. Let's jump down to the part I want you to see. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That's what it says. In the last days, we're going to love pleasure more than we're going to love God. Then it says this, having a form of godliness but denying his power. Now let's keep reading. From, and from such people turn away. Why? Because if you're not careful, you can buy right into their trap. See, there are people out there that are miserable. You know what they want you to do? They want you to be miserable with them. Now, there's so many things to this. We, we live in a generation who seeks a lot of money and seeks a lot of worldly pleasure, and we, we really put aside the godly values. And, and the truth is, the only real pleasure and the only real greatness in, in, in life it is satisfying our soul is going after God. That's the only thing that's going to fill that void inside of you. I, I told you how one of my prisoners called me recently, lives, lives out of state. He called me on the phone. He said, Pastor, I finally got it. So what do you mean? He said, I finally got it. So what did you get? He said, I got saved. I said, well, fantastic. He said, now I finally understand. All those things I had questions, all that void I had, I'm full. Why? Because God is the only one that's going to supply those needs. See, if we're not careful, 
We, we, we find pleasure in drugs, in alcohol. Now, let me go a little further. And one I did not understand for a long time, and, 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 and I'm going to say it out loud, but listen, we have to be careful. There's a lot of kids that are cutting themselves. And they're finding pleasure because, you know what, they want to feel something. And so they start cutting themselves. Now, the first time I saw that, I didn't understand what that meant. But I'm telling you right now, that is not of God. There's so many things out there that people are trying to find pleasure in, and they're losing sight because they don't have, all they have, and let me tell you something, I'm talking to the church. I'm not talking just to the world. There are people in the church today, now I, I don't know where you're at, and I'm not looking directly at you, but I tell you right now, if you've got some issues in pornography, you're going to have some trouble. You're going to have some trouble in your marriage. Well, it enhances my marriage. Oh my God, you're, you're so deceived. You're so deceived. Now I'm talking to a crowd today, our kids are somewhere else, hopefully some of the kids are growing up to hear this. But I'm telling you today, some of the pleasures that people are seeking on the internet is causing a lot of problems in the home. Now, I don't know about y'all, but y'all should have said a greater amen than that. We must put our values in line. We must seek relationships, spend in time. One place he says here in John, he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. And now I'll say to you a new commandment. I give to you that you love one another as I loved you, that you also love one another. By this, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, I don't know about you, but but Julia shared Friday night, they surprised me. And, And I'm telling you, to get one over on me, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. And, and she surprised me so much. When I hit that door, I was so shocked. And I could see the silhouettes of people's heads. And I thought to myself, what is that? Now, I'm telling you this because that's my pleasure. To be able to spend time with people who love me, care about me. You know, there's, I found a long time ago there are people who celebrate you and tolerate you. I want to be around people who celebrate with me. See, that's where pleasure comes from. It's not from false identities, false humility, false this and false that, false relationships. It's from pleasure and enjoying one another. We grow up and we begin to value when we understand how we value popularity. John talks about how there's no wonder you can't believe. For you gladly honor each other, but you don't care about the honor that comes from the one who alone is God. One place says, how do you expect to get anywhere with God when you spend all your time jockeying for position? Popularity. See, it's okay to desire appreciation and goodwill and wishes from others, but don't spend all your whole time chasing it. Don't spend all your time seeking it. Popularity can be short-lived. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. I was thinking about earlier how when I was in seminary, one of the guys I was in seminary with was Kevin Jonas, the father of the Jonas Brothers. And the Jonas Brothers were on the top of the chart for a long time. Matter of fact, I laugh. Kobe tells people that his gnome to fame is he, I think he cut or punched one of the, or pushed one of the Jonas Brothers and he had to have stitches or something. I don't remember. They were, they were playing. They used to play together as kids. And I say that because a lot of people today don't even know who they are. Come on, then there's one of them that's kind of broke out and kind of done his own thing. He's made some movies and stuff. But I say that because are you willing to give up everything for Hollywood? You know, I, I, I recently was so distorted 
and so distraught when I saw, look, I was, I was going to Philadelphia. I'm, I'm on my way to Philadelphia with, with the Saints. And in the last second of the game, I sat and watched with amazement. The devil showed up. Amen? It was the devil. I'm telling you, it was the devil all in that, man. But I learned something just recently that made it all okay. The quarterback for Minnesota, who's a rookie, came out. Is it Minnesota? Vikings. No. Is it? I'm trying to forget it. That's what I'm trying to do right now. But he came out and talked about one of the greatest things in his life was his salvation with Christ. And I thought to myself, I'm not saying I want him to, to win every time. I'm, I'm, but you know what? When somebody says something like that, you got to look at him and go, you know, he understands his popularity. He understands how he got there. I'm not saying it makes it okay. <laughs> I'm still struggling, and, and, and God knows I have to deal with that. Pray for me. But you know what? What's more important? That's when we learn to put our values in line, our popularity. And then we talk about how we really grow up when we learn to value our position. Hmm. Don't waste energy striving for perishable food that like work for the food that strives with you. Hmm. Listen, we need to understand our position. And our position is Christians, believers, Christ-like. And I don't know about you, but we need to value our position. Don't, don't let your position... God, I'm going to say this out loud. When I first started pastoring, there were people who wanted titles. And I'm one of these guys that, you know what? Nobody has to tell me your title. I believe your position, if you're in a true position of God, you always rise without anybody. You know who they are without somebody saying who they are. Does that make sense? You know, I believe that, that when we're in the, doing the right things for God, listen, when you're in management and you, you're managing, if you've got to tell people, look, I'm the manager, you're not doing something right. And I believe with all my heart that people respect positions that people don't have to tell you. Listen, I, I remember one time I, I was at this guy's house and I was fixing to leave and, and, and I was backing out and, and this other guy showed up and I rode down my window and he's talking to me and the guy that I was leaving the house and he had a foul mouth. I mean, he was saying this, that, and everything else. And I'm just sitting there and the guy's just kind of, he's looking and looking and looking because he knows I'm, I'm his pastor and he's, he's kind of embarrassed because the guy is really saying some real foul things. And I'm I'm sitting there, and finally I noticed he had an, a, a cross around his neck. And so I don't know why I did this, but I reached over and I kind of just grabbed that cross and kind of looked at it. And he goes, oh, yeah. He says, I'm a Christian. He said, I'm a deacon at such and such Baptist church. I'm this. And boy, he started telling me everything he was. And all I said was, man, I'm glad you told me because I would have never known. And I backed up and left. You should have seen his face. You should have seen the guy that, that was house. He was like, <laughs> he thought I was funny. But the truth was, I would have never known his position. Come on, unless you told me. If you've got to tell everybody, you're not doing something right. I, I remember when, when I got saved, and, and I told my mom, she was at the beauty parlor telling all her friends, oh, Bobby got saved, Bobby got saved. And I told her, Mom, don't tell everybody that. She thought, well, maybe I didn't get saved, maybe I was embarrassed. I said, no, Mom, here's the truth. If you've got to tell them, then I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. See, we have to, we have to go there. Now, for just a moment, I'm going to wrap this up, but what I want to spend a few seconds talking about is something that I feel like God laid on my heart. And one is when we understand the value of who we are and our position in Christ, then we have to walk this thing out. And walking it out sometimes can be the difficult part. And so I started thinking for a second, and I wrote a few things down here, and I put down here, you know, 
what, how, do we, how, do we do, how do we walk this thing out we call faith? What, what, what must we do to walk this thing out? How do we walk out this thing we call faith? The first thing is we've got to walk by faith. The only way we can walk by faith is we have to walk on the Word of God. The Word of God has to be our foundation. Even the Bible says in one place, the, the Word is like a lamp unto our feet. If we don't have the Word as our foundation, then we'll never walk out our faith. We have to understand what the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15. We have to study to show ourselves a proof unto God. Our workmen need not to be ashamed, rightly divine in the word of truth. If you don't know God's word, then you're going to have a hard time walking on God's word. There are people today that are quoting things that they think are God's word, and they're not. I tell the story because I think it's humorous. When I got back from Russia, I was preaching in a little church down in Donaldsonville. And I thought something, I quoted it like it was a scripture. And later on, I asked Julia, I said, Julia, where's that scripture that I quoted? She said, that wasn't a scripture, that was a country and western song. <laughs> Not on my telling you, it sounded like a scripture. But you know, the truth is, if I keep quoting country and western song, I start saying, all my exes live in Texas. <laughs> Come on. We have to understand that the Word of God is what we walk on. And if we're going to walk on the Word, then we have to walk with the anointing. Now, when I say the word anointing, I want you to understand it's not some spooky whatever. When we talk about the anointing of God, Jesus Christ, Christ is not His last word, last name. Christ means the anointed one. And until we have Christ before us, behind us, around us, surrounding us, all around us, in us, because we are the vessel of Christ, then we're going to have a hard time walking this thing we call faith. Now, I use this illustration because I think it's just so visual, and I, and I love it the first time I ever heard somebody say it, but it talks about how the shepherd anointed the sheep's oil, anointed their head with oil. And they anointed their head with oil because sheep are not the brightest animals in the kingdom. And sheep, when the, the shepherd would anoint their heads with oil, when all the bugs and all the flies and all the fleas and all the things would land on the sheep, if the sheep didn't have their head with this anointing oil on them, then it would perhaps lay eggs or perhaps begin to get into the skin. And sheep, not being that bright, would take their hoofs and begin to beat themselves up to the point trying to kill the bugs. But when the shepherd would anoint their head with oil, those fleas and she all that stuff that would come would just not land, it would slide right off. Guess what? When we walk with the anointing of God, when the anointing of God is on our life and in our life, when those bugs and those fleas and those flies, and they have them in life, come our way, they don't stick, they slide right off. But we have to have that anointing if we're going to carry out this thing we call faith. We walk this thing we call faith when we go back and understand that we serve a God of love. Now we talk about it, and we, 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 we even say it, but I think to the most of us, for the most part, the world has a way of perverting that word. And it gets to the point where we sing about, and, and I laugh because my wife thinks this is a song about me, I love my tractor, amen? Amen. We love things that really have no value. And the truth is, we have to love people like Christ loves us. But here's the part of loving that I think is so important and so significant for us to begin to value the things we call life and begin to walk this thing out. The thing that we should value in love is we have to be quick to forgive. Because if we're not quick to forgive, listen, we will spend a whole lifetime enslaved by the enemy. Because the Bible says that the, the, the Satan goes like a roaring lion seeking who he can devour. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to walk this lion, I want him on a leash. I want to control him. He ain't going to control me. And he controls you when you don't walk in forgiveness. Because if you're not walking in forgiveness, I promise you, you're walking in misery. 
And I don't care what somebody's done. I don't care how much they took from you. I don't care. Listen, I could, I could give you a list of things that I would try to share with you today. You would think, there's no way in the world I could forgive somebody for doing that. But you know what? To me, it's old news. Why? Because I want to go on with the good stuff. I want to move on with the new stuff. I want to become the new man. I want to grow in Christ because I value my relationship with God more than I value what they've done to me. Forgiveness. And the last one is simply, if we're going to walk out this thing by faith, is we have to keep on keeping on. We have to keep on keeping on. There's so many people that get so lost. Now, I say that because, listen, when you learn to keep on keeping on, sometimes, sometimes you might get hurt. Sometimes you might lose your shoes. Sometimes you might shot or whatever, spiritually speaking. But the truth is, you can lay there and quit and have every reason in the world that the world would convince you otherwise that it's okay. Or you can say, you know what, I'm going to keep on keeping on. I'm going to have that bulldog spirit well up inside of me that it doesn't matter what happens. I'm going to keep on keeping on. This morning, very early this morning, I felt the Spirit of the Lord wake me up. And I woke up, and I, and I would love to tell you that I have, and I would be lying to you if I told you this, I, I'd love to tell you that there's things that I can remember in the middle of the night that the next day I remember. And the truth is, there's a lot of things that I feel in certain times, if I don't write them down, I forget them. And so I keep a phone where I can dictate it to it or I can write something or type something or whatever so I can remember the next day. Well, last night, I felt like God had spoke this to me and I got up and, I, and it was so simple. I thought, well, I can remember that. But then I said, I better write it down. So I did. And here's what I wrote down. All these things we're talking about, all these things we value, all these things that we go through, all these things that we deem important. Here's the most important thing of all salvation our salvation because see man can't take that away from you that was a gift from God and the most important thing somebody if somebody comes to me and says well they have a revival down at such and such church and I'll ask them the question well tell me about it well there are people that are laid out all over the place there are people that you know this or this or that this and that well anybody getting saved well they're not really giving a salvation message that's not revival come on because the revival is when people's lives are being radically changed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And without the blood of Jesus Christ, there is no remission for your sins. There is no salvation. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how much money you put in an offering plate. I don't care what you think that you think you are. It doesn't matter your position. It doesn't matter what you possess. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is your salvation. If I came here for the next year and all I preach was salvation I'd have people probably some people get mad at me well that's elementary no that's not that's fundamental doctrine that's what the whole thing boils down to there are people who tell me oh, well you know what I want this because I want to go a little bit further you ain't got what you got now how can you go any further we need salvation and I'm going to send this question out to you, and only you can answer it. And I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm asking you to be honest with yourself. The people around you, do you know that they're saved? Well, well, politically correct, I don't ever talk about it. Listen, you better get unpolitically correct. There are people that need to know about salvation. Well, they, they got their own thing. Open Winfrey had the nerve to tell some lady there's other ways to heaven. The latest is the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. She got mad. 
There's a video out there. I, I seen it. I don't know if it's still out there floating around or whatever, but there was a video some time back floating around where, where this lady raised her hand and says, Oprah, you know what you talk about? There's all kind of ways to get to heaven. The only way to, my Bible says the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And Oprah literally said, are you that small-minded? Well, guess what? I am. Because without Jesus Christ and our salvation, nothing else is important. The most important thing of all is Jesus. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this gathering. And God, I pray that I said what I was supposed to say and not what I'm not supposed to say. But Father, this morning, as there's hearts and people all over this place, the first thing is I'm asking this question, heads bowed, eyes closed. We're not here to embarrass you, not here to call you out. The first question I'm asking today is maybe something in this message. We talked about value, walking out your faith, walking in the Word, walking under the anointing. Maybe something that was said today pierced your heart. I don't need to know what it was, but maybe it's something that you might need in your life. And this morning, what I want to do is I just want to pray for you. I'm not going to call you out, embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. Something this sermon today spoke to you, and it's an area in your life that you might simply say, Pastor, that's an area that I need prayer. Would you pray for me? Heads bowed, eyes closed. If that's you, just put up your hand, put it up, put it down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. I see those hands. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you right now for every soul in this place. God, I thank you for what you've done and what you're about to do. Now, God, it's no way in the world as a man I can know what's on the hearts of your people. But God, I ask you right now by the anointing, by the power of the Holy Ghost, by the Spirit of the Lord, God, I pray that whatever they raise their hand for, God, as we mix our faith together, you begin to unite them in a way that they need to see and do, fulfill. And God, whatever they need, God, you're a God that will supply. Again, heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you showed up today. Maybe you realize for the first time that you're lost in need of a Savior. Or maybe you showed up today and you realize for the first time that you're backslidden. And you're not where you need to be with Christ. And you need to get that right today. From the heart, between you and the Father, just begin to pray. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I repent. I ask for the blood of Jesus to wash away all my sins. Jesus, come in my life. I make you my Lord and my Savior, my Master and my King. Jesus, save me. Redeem me. Again, we're not here to embarrass you, but if you prayed that prayer for the first time or prayed that prayer as a rededication, it doesn't matter. I just want to pray for you. If you prayed that prayer, just slip up your hand, put it up, put it down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. God, I thank you for salvation. I thank you for redemption. I thank you that we can put you first in all that we value. You are our Lord, our King, and our God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Receive that word. Let's give God a hand. Amen.